Hi everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to attend my talk. I'm Rebecca Taft, and today I'm going to tell you about CockroachDB. First, let me tell you the story of a modern company. This company has core markets in Europe and Australia, and a growing market in the US. To support this global user base, they've made the strategic decision to migrate to a cloud database management system. But they have a number of requirements to consider. As a global company, they need fine-grained control over data placement to ensure compliance with local regulations like GDPR. Their users expect an always-on experience, so the database must be fault-tolerant and highly available. Finally, to simplify application development, the database must provide strongly consistent SQL. This is a real company, and as you might expect, I'm telling you the story because the database they chose was CockroachDB. This graphic shows the plan for their CockroachDB deployment. This is just one company, but we designed CockroachDB to support workloads like this because we think their requirements are becoming more and more common. There are a number of challenges with supporting workloads like this, but in the interest of time today, I'll focus on two. The first challenge is how to place data for compliance, performance, and fault tolerance reasons. The second challenge is how to support consistent and fast geodistributed transactions. Let's begin. To understand how we address this first challenge of fine-grained data placement, you need to understand a bit about the architecture of CockroachDB. CockroachDB is a shared nothing system and consists of a distributed SQL layer on top of a distributed key value store. Logically, the key value store is laid out in a single monolithic ordered key space. For example, here you can say, see a database of dogs, which I'll use as a running example throughout the rest of this talk. Notice that for simplicity, I'm only showing the keys here, but you can imagine that the real database would also have values with other data about the dogs. The logical key space is physically realized by dividing it into contiguous ranges of keys, which we call ranges with a capital R. Ranges are about 64 megabytes in size, which is configurable. Ranges start empty, grow, split when they get too large, and merge with their neighbors when they get too small. Ranges are physically stored on a per node key value store. We currently use RocksDB for our storage layer, but we're actually in the process of changing that. Ranges are also an important concept in CockroachDB since they're the unit of replication. We use the raft consensus protocol for replication, and each range is a raft group. Let me just emphasize that each range is a raft group because we do not replicate at the level of nodes, we replicate at the level of ranges. This allows us fine-grained control over data placement and allow, also allows us to configure the replication factor on a per-range basis to make certain important ranges more fault-tolerant. A distributed consensus protocol like Raft provides a useful building block, which is atomic replication. Write commands are proposed by the leaseholder, which for the purposes of this talk, uh, you can assume is the same as the Raft leader. And the command is accepted when a quorum of replicas acknowledge and write it to disk. Now that I've told you how we store and replicate data, how do we actually distribute data across the cluster? There are five signals that CockroachDB uses to determine replica placement, which you see here. The first signal is the most important and will override all the others. User-defined constraints basically allow a DBA or an application developer to specify on a per row basis where data is allowed to reside. For example, you can ensure compliance with GDPR by specifying that the data for European customers must not leave EU data centers. You can also get performance benefits by specifying that data should reside close to the users that are accessing it most frequently. I don't have time to go into detail about the other four signals, but you can imagine that we try to balance load and space utilization across the cluster. Diversity refers to the fact that we try to spread replicas across diverse failure domains to ensure availability in the case of a node, rack, or even a full data center failure. And finally, we try to automatically reduce latency by moving the leaseholder for a range close to its point of most frequent access. Moving on to the next challenge, how do we support consistent and fast geodistributed transactions? The first thing to know about transactions in CockroachDB is that they are always serializable. We don't support any lower isolation levels. Transactions can also span arbitrary ranges, and they support a conversational protocol. The conversational protocol is important for supporting SQL, where the full set of operations may not be known up front. As we all know, an important property of transactions is that they are atomic. To guarantee atomicity even for transactions that span multiple ranges, 
CockroachDB takes advantage of the range level atomicity of Raft. Each transaction is associated with a transaction record, which is stored in a range just like other data. Updates to the transaction record go through Raft, which is how we support atomicity for transactions. Let's look at a simple example so you can uh, better understand how transactions work in practice. Just so you're aware, I'm going to start by showing you an older suboptimal version of the algorithm since it's a bit easier to understand. What you see here is a cluster with uh, three ranges spread across four nodes. The leaseholders for each range are highlighted with a black outline. This insert statement is inserting two rows into our docs table, Sunny and Aussie. To begin, the client connects to a gateway node, which connects to the leaseholder uh, for the range containing Sunny. Since Sunny is the first key written as part of the transaction, the transaction record is created on the range containing Sunny. To replicate the transaction record, the leaseholder proposes a RAF command, which writes the record to itself and the follower replicas. Once the leaseholder and at least one of the followers accept the creation of the transaction record, the transaction is in progress. Next, the same leaseholder proposes a RAF command that writes Sunny to itself and the followers. It again waits for a quorum before moving on. Notice that I've highlighted Sunny in yellow, which indicates that Sunny has been updated by an active transaction that may or may not be committed. We tag each updated record with the transaction ID so that other transactions can check the corresponding transaction record to determine the status. Moving on to the next operation, we write Aussie. So the gateway node uh, passes the operation to the leaseholder for the range containing Aussie. And notice that this is happening in parallel with the final replica of Sunny acknowledging the write, since we already had a quorum before and we didn't need to wait. Once again, the leaseholder for Aussie will propose a raft command uh, to write the record to itself and its followers. One of the followers will acknowledge, and since we have a quorum, the write is complete. As a final step, the gateway node commits the transaction by updating this transaction record from pending to committed. I'm not showing it here, but this is also a replicated operation that requires an additional round of consensus. Once the commit is done, we can uh, return to the client and tell the client that the transaction is complete. There's also a background process that releases the transaction markers from the records so that those keys can be read more quickly. So that's basically it, but notice that I've omitted a huge number of details from the ex explanation. I haven't explained how we handle read-write or write-write conflicts. I haven't described distributed deadlock detection. I haven't explained how we handle long-running transactions. What I described was also the original protocol of CockroachDB. It's correct, but it requires multiple round trips of raft writes. We've been steadily evolving this protocol, and the current protocol, which we describe in the paper, can commit a distributed transaction with the latency of a single round trip with additional asynchronous round trips to perform cleanup. We call this pipelining, and the original transaction protocol I'm referring to here as serial. Let me walk through the same example again so you can see how pipelining reduces the impact of round trips. Here we have the first two operations, begin transaction and write sunny. With the serial protocol, we had to wait for each write to complete before initiating the next write. So we would write the transaction record, wait for it to complete. Write sunny, wait for it to complete. With pipelining, we can fire off the write to sunny, but we don't need to wait for it to complete. The transaction record is also not written until later, and this is safe because there's a small grace window where the transaction can have a non-existent transaction record, and that means it's in progress rather than aborted. With pipelining, we can initiate the second write before waiting for the first to complete. And the commit is also pipelined, but we need to mark the transaction record in this case as staged rather than committed. Staged basically means that the transaction is finished, but it's not clear yet whether the commit was successful. Once all the writes complete successfully, the gateway node knows that the commit was successful and therefore it can return to the client. Notice that with pipelining, we were able to reduce the latency of this transaction from four round trips down to one. And we see this performance improvement in practice as well. I encourage you to check out the paper where we have a number of performance results. In addition to supporting geo-distributed workloads with good performance and strong consistency, we wanted CockroachDB to be easy to use. 
Make data easy is actually our company motto. And for that reason, we decided to add support for the Postgres dialect of SQL. I didn't have time to talk much about SQL today, but the paper describes how we support scale-out distributed SQL, cascades-based query optimization, and online schema evolution. The paper also has an extensive performance evaluation, which shows that the performance of CockroachDB matches or exceeds that of other commercial offerings on industry standard benchmarks. And there's a whole lot more in the paper, so I encourage you to check it out. As a final note, I wanted to mention that CockroachDB is open source and we welcome contributions. We're continually improving the system and we'd love your help. Thanks for listening.